Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Rudy, and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, connect with, uh, with Transmart. What I'm going to tell you about is a data layer that you might not have considered that we're uh, discovering is increasingly important for a whole range of different physiological conditions and diseases, and where it might be uh, very interesting to connect that with some of the other data layers that you're capturing. So uh, I, want, uh, I want to start by asking you to consider what did you see when you looked in the bathroom mirror this morning? I saw an organism that's 43% human, not just because I hadn't had my damn coffee yet, um, but uh, it's remarkable to think of what makes us human, right? And uh, when we think about efforts like the Human Genome Project, which cost about $3.8 billion to determine the first human genome sequence, that's a pretty remarkable scale of government investment, but the ROI on that investment has already been estimated at 140 to 1. So uh, investing in this kind of uh, technology in, uh, in, in understanding our basic biology is remarkably effective. However, we might have left a few parts out in the Human Genome Project. So if we consider what makes up our bodies, we have about 30 trillion human cells. We have about 39 trillion microbial cells. So that's where that 43% human number comes from. Now you might be thinking, uh, hey, wait a minute, it's really our DNA that makes us human. So let's think about that for a moment. Um, each of us has about 20,000 human genes, depending on what exactly we count in terms of non-coding RNAs and stuff. But the size of our microbial gene catalog ranges from 2 to 20 million microbial genes. So by that measure, we're at best 1% human. And in this context, it's pretty hard to do systems biology and systems medicine if we're neglecting 99% of the system, which is what we do when we neglect the microbial side of ourselves. So in some ways, it's almost like we're discovering this overlooked organ that weighs about as much as our brain, about three pounds, but has more genes, way more cells, and arguably even more complexity. And of course, most of these microbes are in our gut, but the microbes over the rest of our body, like our skin, our mouth, uh, our urogenital tract, and so on, also play important roles that we're just beginning to understand. And what enables all of this is that today we can map our microbiomes like never before, largely due to advances in DNA sequencing. And a lot of you probably think of this critter as a classic gut microbe, um, E. coli, right? But the truth is that E. coli makes up much less than, uh, the, than one cell out of a million of the gut of most healthy adults. The reason why we know so much about it is that, that we're great at growing, uh, growing it in captivity, unlike the vast majority of the anaerobes that are in there. So it's kind of like trying to understand the rainforest by looking at each animal in its cage over in the San Diego Zoo and knowing nothing about its interactions with other species or the habitat where it really lives. So uh, to get around this, we turn to DNA. And what enables all of this is that DNA sequencing has got about 10,000 times cheaper in the last 10 years, about a million times cheaper in the last 15, dramatically outpacing Moore's law in terms of the data generation. And this is really important because you probably wouldn't pay $100 million to find out what's in your gut, unless you're like Donald Trump or something. But uh, you might pay 100 bucks, and, so, uh, and, and so that's the price point we're at at the moment. And for example, in the Human Microbiome Project, uh, together with uh, hundreds of collaborators around the country, so my lab uh, played uh, a few um, small roles in this large-scale project, um, we spent $173 million looking at the healthy microbiome of 250 people at up to 18 sites on the body, which, as you can imagine, is a lot of places to stick a Q-tip. And in this project, we collected four and a half terabases of DNA, so 1,500 human genome equivalents. And uh, one thing that was amazing about this was how quickly the results leapt from the pages of Science and Nature to a few weeks later, the cover of Scientific American, a couple of weeks after that to the cover of The Economist. And uh, today, companies like Ceres Therapeutics have over a billion dollars in market cap, which is amazing when you consider they didn't exist when these results were being published just a few years ago. Uh, but the problem is that we got all this DNA sequence data, and I'm sure you're familiar with the difficulties de of dealing with next-gen sequence data. Here's the first file of data from the HMP. Actually, this is the first 0.1% of this file, and there's another 17,000 just like it. And despite the fact that what we're doing is fundamentally an ecology project, it's pretty hard to tell who lives where in the environment from this, right? And so the, uh, so the issue for your physician, if you're going in there with your profile of a thousand species out of your gut, or worse yet, a million genes out of your gut, uh, and, and saying, you know, hey, doc, can you tell me what's wrong with me with all this data? What are they going to do, right? They're going to refer you to their, psychiatr uh, to, to their psychiatrist colleagues for being crazy enough to think that they can do, uh, do something with that in your 15-minute visit. 
And so uh, our challenge as a community is to make it not crazy anymore and figure out how to integrate each individual's data uh, with large-scale data resources to, uh, to understand and to interpret all of this information. Um, and so, uh, and, and so uh, in my lab, we developed this high-throughput barcoded sequencing protocol where essentially what we do is we use molecular tags um, to tag each sample uh, with a unique barcode using, uh, using Golay error-correcting codes and then mix them together and sequence hundreds of samples in a single sequencing run, originally on 454, but more recently on Illumina, which has higher throughput and better error rates. And then we can figure out uh, what, uh, using the barcodes, what sequence came from what sample, uh, trim them, group the sequences into taxa, and then put them on a phylogenetic tree and use that tree to cluster all the data. And we implement this in an open source pipeline called CHIME, which stands for Quantitative Insights into Microbial Ecology. Uh, it's free, it's open source, runs anywhere from your laptop to the Amazon EC2 cloud to the Comet supercomputer here, uh, which is this $24 million NSF instrument. It's one of the largest we've run it on. And so uh, we have this community of open source developers essentially making it so this large user community can take the data off their sequencing instrument and get interpretable insights from it. So um, this is uh, another really important part is that this is all enabled by Genomic Standards Consortium standards. So I'm on the board of the GSC, and a lot of what we do is come up with uh, standards for integrating uh, information from different data layers, especially DNA sequence data, and contextual information about the samples and the subjects. Uh, and so, for example, uh, a, a few years ago in Nature Biotech, we published these specifications for how you need to encode uh, the, uh, the uh, contextual information about each sample so that you can make sense of it uh, in light of other samples in an automated way. Um, and so the idea is that you have uh, descriptors that are based on the type of sequence, like genomes, metagenomes, marker gene sequences, and then new checklists for uh, emerging types of data, uh, and then things like environment packages that allow us to annotate in a systematic way uh, the data from particular kinds of samples. So when we apply this to the Human Microbiome Project data, so this is a principal coordinates analysis of unifract distances where we use evolution to place each pair of samples uh, on, on, um, on, on this map, uh, you get this much more interpretable picture of all that data in the HMP. So each point in this represents all the complexity of a microbial community, such as this oral biofilm, distilled down to just one point on the map. And so two points are close together if their bacteria share more evolutionary similarity, and they're further apart if their bacteria are more evolutionarily dissimilar. So uh, if I highlight these by body site, you can immediately see the main thing going on, which is that different parts of the body have different microbes. And so this is what primarily drives microbial communities, not how old you are, not what time of day the sample was collected, uh, not all kinds of other things that you might imagine would drive the result. And to put this in perspective, if I highlight the mouth and the gut of one person on this map, uh, you see they're in these totally different regions. And it wasn't until we did the Earth Microbiome Project where we went out on the planet and used crowdsourcing to get tens of thousands of environmental samples and sequenced all of those that we could understand the, how profound these differences on different parts of the human body were. Because if you think of your mouth as being like a coral reef, so these complex mineralized structures covered with biofilms, maybe your dentist pesters you about those, the amazing fact is that your mouth is just as far away from your gut in terms of the bacterial community it has in it as, this, as the microbes in this reef are from the microbes in this prairie. And that's amazing, right? Because it means a few feet along the length of your body makes as much difference to your microbial communities as thousands of miles across the Earth's surface. And so it's not that you have one microbiome, but you have a whole archipelago of connected microbiomes that influence each other and that we're just beginning to understand the, div uh, the diversity of. So uh, each of us has a unique journey through this microbial map. And that journey starts at birth, and this leads us to wonder, where do our first microbes come from? Where do we begin on this map? And if you have dogs or kids, as I do, you likely have some dark suspicions about that, all of which turn out to be true, by the way. So I can match you up to your dog with fairly high precision by the microbes you share. But in all seriousness, uh, our first microbes as infants depend on our delivery mode. And so uh, what I'm showing you here is work we did with Gloria dominguez Bello, now at NYU, uh, where we're looking at mothers sampled an hour before they gave birth, and then their babies 20 minutes after birth. And uh, what we can see is when we look at the, uh, when we look at the uh, samples from all over the bodies of babies delivered naturally, uh, shown here in pink, you can see that all of those samples cluster with the vaginal samples of the mother. Whereas in contrast, when we look at samples from all over the bodies of babies uh, delivered by C-section in light blue, uh, 
you can see that they cluster uh, together with the skin samples of all of the mothers in dark blue. And that's amazing, right? You start off with these totally different microbial communities, and we think these, these may, uh, th these may uh, be responsible for driving some of the average differences in health between C-section and vaginally delivered babies, where if you're delivered by C-section, you're more likely to, uh, to get asthma, more likely to get uh, allergies. Even some studies have reported more likely to get autism. And, um, and, and so those, those very early life interactions with your first microbes may be responsible for this. Um, so this may lead you to wonder, well, what happens after that? And this is what we did with Ruth Lay, who's now a director at the MPI. And uh, what we're looking at is the development of the uh, stool of one, um, of one infant, her own, uh, over the first two and a half years of life. And in case you're wondering why two and a half years, it's a hell of a lot easier to get the fecal sample out of a diaper than it is to fight a kid who's proudly learned how to flush for every single sample. So a lot of studies tend to end at about this time. And um, we're just going to look at stool samples. You can see that his first stool is in this vaginal region of the map, which we would expect from his delivery mode, so completely different from the adult microbiome. Then the question is, over those two and a half years, when we connect up successive points on his journey through this map, how, how completely does he approach the adult stool? Is it a fast journey or is it slow? Uh, is, it, um, is it smooth or are there a lot of events along the way and so forth? And each frame in this is one week in his developing microbiome. And uh, when, when I play this, you can see that uh, sometimes he changes just a little one week to the next, sometimes it's a lot. Remember what matters primarily on these maps is distance, and, um, and so the difference between the same kid one week and the next is sometimes bigger than the difference between any two adult uh, healthy people in the HMP. So if you think your kid's a different person one week to the next, it's literally true in terms of their gut microbes. And coming up here is something fascinating. So he gets antibiotics for an ear infection, you see that massive regression of the microbiome, followed by recovery. So that went by pretty fast, so I'm just going to rewind it for you and play it for you again. What you can see is on administration of oral amoxicillin for an ear infection, we see this massive undoing in just a few weeks of months of normal development, followed by recovery in just a few weeks. Remember, each frame is one week in the life of his microbiome. And then by the time he's two and a half, he's basically in the healthy adult state. But that doesn't happen for every kid, and especially through the American Gut Project, we're hearing from all kinds of parents whose kids' uh, physiology or even behavior has changed fundamentally, either for better or for worse, after taking a course of antibiotics. And we don't know yet what leads to some kids being resilient and other kids being irreversibly altered by a course of antibiotics. And this leads to this very uh, important question about whether controlling single pathogen species has led to a microbial silent springs situation in the gut. Because over the 20th century, as infectious diseases from measles to TB were brought under control, you see this explosion of autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease and type 1 diabetes and asthma, uh, which has an immune component. And what fascinates me is that in 2002, when this graph was published in the New England Journal, none of these diseases had been linked to the microbiome. Whereas today, we know all four of them and dozens of others that are accelerating rapidly in frequency are linked to the microbiome. And so Marty Blazer uh, has written this wonderful book, Missing Microbes, summarizing his work, uh, linking, uh, linking early life antibiotics to obesity, both experimentally in mice and, uh, in, um, and in epidemiological studies in humans, uh, as well as the various sources of, um, of, of loss of microbial diversity in Western populations. So, um, so, so our journeys through these microbial maps really matter tremendously for our health. And I mentioned a number of diseases that have been linked to the microbiome in recent years. And uh, one disease that I've been studying with Jeff Gordon's lab for about the last 10 years is obesity. And today, for example, I can tell you with 90% accuracy whether you're lean or obese based solely on the microbes in your gut. So on the one hand, from a technical perspective, this is a really cool trick. On the other hand, we don't think it has a lot of commercial potential as a test for obesity because I bet you can tell which of these people is obese knowing nothing about their microbial DNA. Right? But if we try to do that classification task, lean or obese, based on your human DNA, we can only do that with 57% accuracy using every SNP ever associated to obesity by DWAS, whereas we can do it with 90% accuracy based on your microbiome. 
And um, if you think about how rapidly obesity is spread, although human genes are important in explaining variation in obesity between different people, the obesity epidemic cannot be a human genetic disease. Because if you look at it sweeping from 1985 through 2010, uh, increasing, um, increasing in abundance in the South, so you'll see yellow popping up for 20%, then orange, then red for 30% obesity. This is happening way too fast for it to be a change in human gene frequencies, right? Because either all the lean people would have to be sterile or all the obese people would have to have like a dozen kids each. And in either case, we would have noticed, right? It wouldn't be a secret. So another map that's fascinating is this map of antibiotic prescriptions per thousand people. And if I put those maps next to each other, you see a tremendous, although not perfect, but still very high concordance between antibiotic prescriptions and obesity, which, cons which is consistent both with the animal model data uh, and uh, with the epidemiological data that's starting to accumulate in humans across multiple countries. So uh, then the question is, how do you actually prove causality? And the way we prove causality, and again, this has worked with Jeff Gordon's lab at Wash U, is we go into mice. And so we take these germ-free mice that are raised in a bubble with absolutely no microbes of their own. And then we ask if we take the gut bacteria from an obese person and a lean person and transplant those into those mice, what happens to the mice? And the remarkable fact is if you take the microbes from an obese person, put them into a germ-free mouse, you get a fat mouse. That's not true if you take their twin who's lean and transplant their microbes where the mice remain lean. And the, ro the most remarkable part of this is we can actually design a microbial community based on the microbes from lean people that we can inoculate these mice with, expose them to the obese people's microbes, and prevent them from gaining that weight. Now, before you ask, we, ta we can't do this in people yet, but we're working really hard on that in the current phase of our program project grant together. And, um, and so these microbial transplants prove causality. And one thing that you might not have expected is that they even work for behavior. So you can make a timid mouse brave or a brave mouse timid, not by manipulating its mouse genes, but by swapping their microbes with each other. Uh, we can also do this sort of thing for undernutrition. So for example, Kwashiorkor is a profound form of uh, malnutrition that's prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, when, uh, when we worked with Mark Minari and Jeff Gordon to take uh, kids who are discordant for quash and transplant their microbes into germ-free mice, uh, the microbes from the quash twins uh, cause the mice to do very badly. So they lose 30% of their body mass in just three weeks. They die if they're left untreated. But we can rescue them with the same peanut butter-based supplement that's used on the children in the clinic. And we see a profound change both in their microbiome and in their physiology that we do not see in the mice that are colonized with the healthy twins' microbes. And so what's amazing about this is that it really establishes this idea that you can do an intervention in sets of germ-free mice um, that are colonized with an individual's microbiome and then see individual responses, in this case to nutrition, but you could imagine doing the same kind of thing for drug therapy or even for surgery. And uh, the effects of nutrition um, may well be mediated by the microbiome in ways that we're just beginning to appreciate. And one thing that's fascinating about, uh, about uh, large-scale studies of nutrition is that, in general, the effects are very modest. So uh, in this study published in the New England Journal in 2011, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the team that did this studied 120,000 people over 20 years, tracking the effect of each food item over those 20 years. So, um, and, and so uh, if, if you're thinking of, uh, and, and so what I'm going to show you is the, the individual food items that are most associated with weight loss and weight gain. So it might not surprise you that much that the food item most associated with weight loss is yogurt, but the effect size might surprise you. So each extra serving of yogurt every single day only causes you to lose about, uh, about um, three quarters of a pound a year. Now, it's probably not going to surprise you that the food that is worst for you in terms of weight gain is fries, but each additional serving of fries every day only leads to about one and a half pounds of weight gain per year. So the effects averaged over the whole population are surprisingly modest, even for the diametrically opposed food <laughs> items in terms of their effect. What's interesting, though, is that there's tremendous levels of individual variation. And a lot of people have experienced for themselves, or also experience, uh, and a lot of clinicians have experienced with, with their patients, that cutting out an individual food item has dramatically different effects on different people, where some people will lose a whole lot of weight, other people will gain a whole lot of weight. And a very elegant Israeli study uh, that was published in Cell at the end of last year explains this in terms of glycemic response in terms of the microbiome. 
And so what they did is they took 800 people and fed them a standardized sequence of diets so they could, look, uh, so they could use continuous glucose measurements uh, of, of the blood to figure out what was the effect of each food item on each person in terms of the glycemic response. And what was amazing about this is when they averaged the results over 800 people, they recaptured to within 1% of the glycemic index of each food. But the individual variability in glycemic index was huge. And what was amazing about this is that they could use it to design diets that would either keep each individual's blood glucose under control or send it completely haywire, despite keeping the macronutrient balance and the calories exactly the same. And one of the key punchlines for this is that for some people, it's actually better to eat a bowl of ice cream than it is to eat a bowl of white rice in terms of your blood glucose response. And on learning this, a lot of people want to know, could I do a test to find out which category I'm in? And the answer is yes, but only if, if you're Israeli, because these kinds of things have to be trained on each population where the food items are different and the background microbiomes are different. But then the more interesting question is, suppose I'm in the, uh, suppose I'm in the rice category and I want to be in the ice cream category. Could I figure out how to shift my microbiome to get from one category into the other? And that's a very interesting possibility, uh, where if we found out the right control parameters of the system, we might be able to get towards that kind of scenario. So, uh, I, so, so mostly I've been talking about what happens with microbiomes within the human body, but I wanted to tell you briefly about some of the remarkable discoveries that we're making about the microbes that surround us. And a lot of this is enabled by high-throughput sequencing and high-throughput mass spectrometry, which allows us to look at the chemical environment as well as the microbial environment. And so, um, and so this really started, uh, so to give you a sense of progress, this is the kind of thing that we could do in 2010, uh, where uh, what we were doing is looking at the bathrooms down the hall from my lab in Boulder and just asking where are the microbes in the bathrooms. Um, and uh, if we use the Bayesian method to track the sources of those microbes back to the communities that they came from, do we see any consistent spatial patterns? Um, and, so, uh, and, and so fortunately, uh, so, so a lot of this makes sense, right? Like the skin, you find, the skin signal you find on the door handle, the faucets and other things that you touch, including the toilet seat, which you're touching with a different part of your skin. Uh, the stool community is largely confined inside the bathroom stall, which was kind of nice. And then we see the soil community mostly on the floor, but we also see a fair amount of it on the flush handle. And coming from New Zealand, I had never heard of the following cultural practice, but apparently in the US, a lot of people like to use their feet to flush. And so we pick up that, the signal from the dirt on their shoes directly on the flush handle. And so you can discover quite a lot of beha about behavior from looking at these high resolution maps. So that was in 2010. Here's what we can do six years later. And this is in collaboration with Peter Durstein's lab. This is a 3D scan of Peter's office uh, that we do with a little handheld LiDAR unit that you can just stick onto an iPad. And um, so I'll just rotate that around. Uh, this is me, uh, this is Peter, uh, this is Larry Smarr, who you probably recognized from his talk the other day, uh, and this is one of Peter's postdocs. And what we did is we swabbed hundreds of sites in the office and looked at all the microbes and all the metabolites, and, uh, and basically blue means, there isn't, um, blue means there isn't any of a particular microbe. Uh, all the way up to red, uh, where there's the most, and ditto for the metabolites. And so you can see this one molecule that lights me up really brightly and Larry up really brightly, but not the rest. And the molecule that we're looking at is caffeine, um, and this makes a lot of sense if you know us. And then uh, Peter doesn't drink coffee or tea, and you can see that there's no signal on him. But you can see that some previous occupant of his office has spilled some coffee there. And while this is undoubtedly the most expensive way to find this out, you can see how this could be really useful in clinical or industrial settings especially when you know that we can also do this with source tracking. So you can see here molecules that are specific to me that I've left on, uh, on, my, uh, on, on my laptop and on my phone, but they're nowhere else in the, in the office. Uh, in fact, back in 2010, we were able to show that we can match the palm of your hand up to the computer mouse you use by the microbial DNA you leave behind with over 90% accuracy. Uh, so this came out in PNES at the time, but more importantly, it was on CSI Miami, so you really know it's true. Uh, and we can also do this for all kinds of other molecules. Um, so this is from that same data set, uh, looking at things like uh, stuff out of plastics. Uh, we can look at sunscreen. Um, so that's where the evobenzone is coming from. Uh, we can see Larry's drugs. Um, we can see things like caffeine, as I mentioned, uh, and also dietary compounds like tryptophan. Um, we can also do this sort of thing for microbes. And what, what we're seeing here is finger monus and Seneca coccus. And essentially what we're getting out of this is that Peter likes to swim in the sea, which is why he's covered with these marine bacteria. And you can see that he's also spread them all over his office environment. Uh, 
Um, so, so what, you're probably thinking, do we really care about these environmental microbes or can we just detect them? Uh, well, one thing that's fascinating, and you might have seen the press reports about this uh, paper that we published in PNAS uh, earlier this year, but in work with Chris Lowry, who's at the University of Colorado, uh, Colorado at Boulder, uh, we show that we can actually take a particular strain of soil mycobacterium, uh, Myco Mycobacterium vacae, and in a mouse model, we can use it to, uh, to inoculate the mice against social stress. So normally you take these little mice and they're in a cage and they're all happy, and you put in a great big mouse that beats them up and then they're stressed, and then after that, uh, they huddle in the corner of their cage, they don't eat, their fur falls out, and their life is very bad. But if you, if you expose them to the soil microbe, before you do that stress condition, then they're extremely resilient and they bounce right back from it. And uh, what's, what's been shown by a number of other investigators, including Sue Lynch at UCSF and Erica von Mutius at the Children's Hospital at Munich, is that other environmental microbes can do all kinds of things like reduce asthma and food allergies and a whole suite of other disorders linked to the immune system. And this is very consistent with what we see in amphibians, where uh, if you take, and this is what we do with Val McKenzie at Boulder, where if you take amphibians and you keep them in captivity, uh, they lose essential microbes from their skin that are required for resistance to fungal infection. So you can rescue them from challenge with that chytrid fungus that's been uh, causing amphibian population declines worldwide. You can rescue them by resupplying as a probiotic just the right microbe from the skin of a healthy frog or as continual input from the soil or from the water microbial communities. And so one really, really important question for us is, are we cutting ourselves off from beneficial microbes that are essential by sitting in these sealed air-conditioned buildings? Because the microbes in the air around us and on all these surfaces that you're touching are primarily derived from human skin with small components from other human body sites. And this is the first time in history that we're stewing in our own microbes because that's not what you see in traditional dwellings like in, in, in the Hadza and the Yanomami and other people, and even in a Victorian house that's all drafty, most of the microbial contribution is not going to be from the human body, but from the environment. And so we're really engaging in this new experiment of exposing ourselves continually to our own microbes. So this may lead you to wonder, um, can, I, can I actually uh, predict my health from my microbiome? And uh, we're going to come back to Larry, uh, and um, this is another view of some of the data that he showed you. And uh, here, here I am shortly after I arrived, uh, describing to him the human microbiome project data on the display wall that he did the demo uh, on over, over in the other room, so the 64 million pixel display wall. And he says, uh, well, well, you know, hey Rob, I, I have a very interesting microbiome. Uh, I'm an IBD patient, and how do I get my data integrated into this large scale data set? So uh, as, uh, as, as you know, uh, any time you're starting at a new institution, you expect a certain amount of crap from your colleagues. And in my case, it's been literally true. So uh, Larry delivered this box of the stool on, on dry ice to my lab. And, uh, and Larry's been, uh, as he told you, he's been measuring various parameters about his body for the last 15 years. And uh, some pretty interesting things happened to his weight, which I'm showing you here, during this period of, uh, of DNA sequencing of his stool. So uh, Larry had been squinting at these plots for a while, looking at the relative abundance of different microbial taxa. And if you don't see anything in that, don't worry, because Larry didn't either, despite throwing a whole lot of supercomputer time at it, and I think a whole lot of personnel effort. But if we replot it uh, using the techniques that I showed you, uh, you, uh, you see these very clear regions of this plot, so the blue region and the red region. And what we're going to do is we're going to animate this as a time series, and you see this initial shift, and then this blue region, and then he switches over, and then bounces around basically at random in this red region. So you're probably thinking, well, so what? Does that have anything to do with his health? So let's match it up to his clinical data. And this really shows the value of being able to take these different data layers and combine them, which is one of the, one, one of the reasons why I would be very excited to figure out how to get this microbial data interfaced with Transmart. Because what you can see is this initial shift with antibiotics in his microbial ecology uh, is, is coupled to this region where there's a whole lot of weight fluctuation. And then after that, um, in this blue region, he's having frequent IBD symptoms, his life is terrible, and his weight is declining because of those IBD symptoms. Uh, so then he decides to uh, switch off his medications, um, and you see this rapid change from the blue to the red region of the plot. And then in this red region, where he's just bouncing around at random after he makes a state switch, you can see that his weight goes back up to a healthy set point, uh, and then he stays more or less stable around that weight going forward. And so what's amazing about this is had we known about these different states within Larry's personal microbial ecology, we would have been, we would have been able to tell him that as soon as he moved into this red, state, uh, this red state, he was going to be fine 
and his IBD symptoms were going to continue to be gone. Right? And so this is why it's so essential to be able to figure out how to take longitudinal data and to make it easier for subjects to sample themselves longitudinally at home and not have to do something like, uh, you, you know, crap in a box, figure out how to get that on dry ice back to a lab or something, but rather do it in a much more lightweight and less invasive way. So, uh, so, so this takes me to this concept of personal microbiomes. And what we'd really like to do is we'd really like to make this kind of technology available, not just if you're the director of a beautiful facility like the one we're sitting in, but uh, if you're just an ordinary member of the public who wants to understand more about uh, the, this microbial side of yourself. And in 2012, uh, Jeff Leach and Jack Gilbert and I launched this project called American Gut, where uh, the idea was to exploit the decline in cost and sequencing uh, to let any interested member of the public find out about their microbiomes uh, using crowdsourcing, uh, using crowdfunding, so that each person's essentially supporting the cost of adding themselves to the project, uh, kind of like the DNA, um, uh, kind of like the National Gen uh, Geographic's uh, Genographic Project on Human DNA. And uh, then, then the idea was to build this huge data set where we could include anyone who was interested in participating. Of course, it turns out that not everyone wants to know what's in there. So these are middle schoolers touring our lab and learning that we're going to use lasers and robots to look at the bacteria in their poop. Uh, you can see a certain degree of response heterogeneity there. We don't yet know if that's linked to their microbiomes, but before long, we'll have the sample size to find out. Um, but it's been remarkably successful for a crowdfunded project. So at this, at this point, we've raised over $2 million, uh, almost all in $99 increments from members of the general public, although we can now accept charitable contributions to, uh, to uh, look at underrepresented populations by disease or by ethnicity or by any other criterion that people are interested in. And uh, we've released data for over 8,000 samples publicly in advance of publication. Uh, essentially what we do is we release the data as soon as it comes off the sequencer and goes through QC. And the idea is for any clinician, any, uh, any researcher, any student, uh, any member of the uh, public, anyone at a company, to just be able to go to this free open resource and understand what does a large number of microbiomes look like backed by an open source pipeline that allows you to completely reproduce all of the analysis on your own, uh, on, on your own and on your own hardware. And uh, on the scale, we're, being, uh, we're, we're able to link the microbiome to all kinds of things that you might not have expected it was associated with. So you might have expected that how old you are affects the diversity of your microbiome, which it does. But another factor that's just as important is how many hours you sleep at night, which you may not have expected it was involved with. And uh, as another example, just last week we published an association between the oral microbiome and migraines, uh, drawn from the citizen science population, but we're now following it up in a clinical population of migraine sufferers with a controlled diet intervention that we, uh, where we think that by artificially manipulating the, mi uh, the, the nitrate levels, uh, we'll be able to confirm this uh, experimentally. And uh, these power curves were put together by Justine Debelius, a very talented postdoc in my lab, where basically on the x-axis we have the number of people per group you need to see an effect. On the y-axis you have statistical power of the test, so 0.8 is 80% power to detect, 1 is 100% power. And so the steeper the curve, the more power you have to detect. And we see things like age and inflammatory bowel disease and uh, antibiotic use all having relatively strong effects. But what's amazing is that the strongest effect, the steepest curve, is how many different kinds of plants you eat. And we never expected that that would be the strongest effect. Uh, Self-reported categories, like whether you're a vegetarian or an omnivore, we see no association with. But a moment's thought will make it immediately clear why, right? Because you can be a vegetarian who mostly eats kale, or you can be a vegetarian who mostly eats potato chips. And those have totally different consequences for your microbiome. But we can also tell all kinds of other things, like how much you sleep, as I mentioned, whether you're male or female, uh, how much you weigh, uh, how much you drink, even how much you exercise. Or I should say how much you say you exercise, because all this is self-reported data. So either we have an association with how much you exercise or with how much you lie about it. And uh, we're doing some controlled experiments to figure out which it is at the moment. Um, but we're also expanding into other populations. We started with Britain and Australia just because it was easy to translate all the materials from English into English. Uh, but we expanded into Asia earlier this year. Uh, we're going, going into Norway uh, towards the end of the year. And then in a whole lot of clinical populations, including uh, those with autism, uh, ICU patients. So this came out, uh, th this came out a few weeks ago. Uh, people with depression. Um, various educational cohorts. And one thing that's especially exciting about being here is being able to interact with a whole lot of different clinical specialties. Uh, so we're looking at people in the cardiac wards, in the oncology wards, uh, in, uh, in, in the 
IBD clinics and so forth to get, uh, to get an idea of who, uh, go, uh, who, who goes into what locations on these microbial maps and how people stratify for treatment. We're also looking at some of the healthiest people around, including the uh, Stein Institute's Healthy Aging Cohort uh, and the 1500 UCSD student athletes, where uh, we're trying to do things like classify what sport they play and how good they are at that sport according to their microbiomes. Um, so the clearest example we have of why you care where you are on this map um, comes, from, uh, com comes from C. diff infections. And so Clostridium difficile, as you probably know, is one of the most important hospital-acquired infections in the United States. It kills 14,000 people a year in the U.S. alone. And uh, this is just to reorient you on the map. When I show you fecal samples from people with C. diff, they're in this totally different region of the map. So these orange spiky things are their stool. They're totally different from the healthy stool. And so the question is, um, so four of these patients are going to get a fecal transplant from this one donor. And the question is kind of like what I showed you with that infantime series. Uh, how much do they progress towards a healthy state? Is it fast or slow? Is it uh, direct or are there detours along the way? Um, only in this case, each frame is going to be one day in the lives of these patients instead of being a whole week, as in the case of the infant. And this is what we did with Mike Sadowski and Alex Karutz at the University of Minnesota. And, uh, what I'm, uh, and, and I'm going to start this now, and what you see is essentially immediately, in just a few days, the entire ecology of their microbiomes changes from the unhealthy state into the healthy state. And then they stay in that healthy state for the months of follow-up, and essentially all their clinical symptoms are gone in just three to five days. So you have people who've been bedridden, they haven't produced a firm stool in years sometimes, uh, producing healthy stool again, and uh, getting up and walking around. And uh, th this, this therapy is remarkably effective. So the, large, la uh, the last large-scale uh, test that directly compared uh, 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 fecal transplant to antibiotics for C. diff had to be stopped early because the antibiotics were only about 30% effective, which is typical for a current C. diff. The fecal transplant was over 90% effective, and it was considered unethical to continue withholding the fecal transplant from the people um, on the antibiotic arm of the trial. So they all got the fecal transplant, and most of them recovered. And so the question that's facing us at the moment is for what other patients can we identify a problem with their microbial community and then bring it back into health, whether it's through something as extreme as fecal transplant or as gentle as diet or something like prebiotics or probiotics or symbiotics or more targeted antibiotics uh, or other kinds of drugs or even surgery or uh, phage therapy or other kinds of things that, uh, that, that, that are now being shown to affect your microbiome and have a mechanism of action involving the microbiome. And so to do this, we need to really rigorously define for all of these different diseases, the good and the bad places on this map, and understand how they relate to each other and how we can clearly turn those into visual displays that are effective for showing patients and showing physicians what do the community changes look like and how do you track that progress over time in a way that makes the invisible visible and meaningful to individuals. But we really need to go beyond this kind of mapping exercise and develop more of a kind of microbial GPS that tells us not just where am I right now, but where do I want to go on this map and what do I want to do in order to get there. And so you can imagine a smart toilet, for example, uh, where as soon as you flush, it's going to do some instant analysis of your microbiome um, and deliver it to your smartphone, which let's face it, I bet you're using in there anyway, and uh, tell you, uh, you know, you're going to a good place or a bad place on the map, and are there any specific recommendations for what, we, what you should do? And, uh, but, but our dream with us is to take it even a step further and make analyzing your microbiome not something that you do uh, in, in a highly technical setting in a lab, but something that's as natural as examining yourself in that mirror in the morning. And so uh, there's already breath tests on the market for things like SIBO and other microbiome imbalances. The idea is that you, uh, that you couple that mirror to a mass spec uh, so that you can do an instant analysis of someone's breath and show them the chemistry of their breath directly on that mirror as they're looking at it. Probably not in this form, but in some sort of more uh, consumer-friendly display. And then what we're hoping is that we can predict from the chemical readout, that we can predict what's going on with their microbiome. Uh, this might be impossible, and we might have to measure the microbiome directly, uh, like having the mirror communicate with their smart toilet, but we're hoping that we can use some of the same technology that's in Google Translate to be able to translate the chemical information into the microbial information and then produce this kind of map where you can tell if you're at risk for a particular disorder, and then maybe what you should be doing in order to reduce that risk and move you back into a more, uh, a more solidly healthy state.
And then you could even imagine having that communicate back with your smartphone so that during the day, instead of catching just the right Pokemon, maybe you can catch the one yogurt out of the thousands and thousands on display at the supermarket that actually has the strain that you're looking for uh, to be able to do a particular metabolic trick that you're lacking or to be able to guide your microbiome back into health. And you could also imagine both on your phone and on that mirror, uh, the, um, a display that's enabled with all this information that you're tracking during the day about your exercise, uh, about your diet and so forth, being able to compute a score from that and then showing you a vision of yourself in the future 10, 20, 50 years down the track. If you do the same thing, uh, if you do the same thing every day for all those years that you did today, or what you might look like if you did a little bit better or a little bit worse. Uh, in terms, um, in, in terms of, these, of these, these health characteristics, and especially including the microbiome. So to tackle this sort of thing, I founded the Center for Microbiome Innovation here at UC San Diego uh, earlier this year. And so the goal of this is to bring people from all across campus, including medicine, engineering, biology, uh, even the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where a lot of the ecologists are and a lot of the drug discovery is happening, and uh, people, in the, people in the social sciences, uh, to come together to, to solve these really difficult problems, together with a series of industry partners. So the two who have signed up officially, uh, as of now, are J&J &J and Illumina, and we're reaching out to many other uh, potential corporate partners at the moment to put together this consortium to solve these hard problems in the microbiome. And uh, we've already built this uh, big data cyber infrastructure that maybe Larry told you about, so I won't get into it too much. But essentially, it connects my lab over in the medical school to this building, uh, to Rady Children's Hospital, uh, at a 1,000 times the speed of the regular internet. And so we're able to uh, generate this data at a scale that's unprecedented and then bring it all together uh, using, big, uh, uh, using large compute resources like the Comet system over at SDSC and the clinical records infrastructure at Rady and at the UCSD hospitals to really make progress on integrating this complex multivariate data set into other information that we have uh, about individual health. Um, and and, uh, and this, this, may seem, this may seem implausible, but, uh, but, but there's, there's precedent for this, because if you look at, um, if you look at the Bell Nutrition Clinic that we work with in Malawi, for example, uh, this photo was taken by Tanya Yatsenenko, one of the very talented grad students working on the project back in 2009. And although the people in this population are not able to afford food, uh, they do have cell phones, for example. And the amazing fact is that there are now over 8 billion active cell phones on Earth, which is pretty impressive when you consider there's only 7 billion cell phones. And of the billion poorest people in the world, more than 20% of them have their own cell phone. So this is a technology that's penetrated everywhere. I took this photo in Bangladesh in 2012, where in relatively bad parts of Dhaka, near the malnutrition population that we study there, you can buy a large part of a cow, and right next to that you can have your cell minutes recharged. Perhaps more remarkably, uh, when I was in Tanzania in 20, uh, 2014, working with the Hadza, who still hunt and gather 95% of their calories, uh, I shook hands with a man who, a couple of weeks before, had shot a giraffe with a bow and arrow that he made himself and traded the skin and the meat uh, to members of the Datoga, the next group over, for the cell phone that he's holding. And he keeps the minutes, uh, he keeps the minutes and electricity topped up with, uh, with honey that he gathers from wild bees. And so you're able to uh, support this kind of high-tech device on a subsistence lifestyle. And, uh, what, uh, and a large part of what makes this possible is that the compute that powers the DSP network is so cheap that it's effectively free, and innovations in hardware have made it much easier to deploy cell towers all over Africa, and they're greatly outstripping landlines. But as I mentioned, one thing that's getting much faster than compute, which is the white line on this chart, is the cost of DNA sequencing. Looks like it's leveled off, but it's about to start declining precipitously again now that Illumina has competition again. And so the potential to take sequencing that's so cheap it's free and computational models that are so cheap that they're free and deploy them everywhere on Earth, I think is really inspiring. So with that, I'd like to thank the large number of people who've worked on some of the stuff that I've, uh, that I've shown you here. Uh, I won't read this out again because I mentioned many of them during the talk. Uh, our many sources of funding um, the amazing people I've had the privilege to work with in my lab, both currently and previously. And uh, finally, I'd be delighted to take any questions that you have at this point. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to connect, and I hope we'll find a way to integrate the microbiome into the other data sets you're looking at. Thank you. Yeah.
No, absolutely not. So the box of dry ice uh, only uh, is, is in like a large open space yeah, and it gets... So no. Yeah, exactly. I'm wondering, since the mouth and the, the fecal samples are so different, what's happening in between? Is it just stomach and then everything else is gut? Oh, yeah, great question. So the stomach's totally different again. Uh, the, um, the, the esophagus is more or less like the mouth, but there's some subtle changes. The small intestine's totally different from the large intestine, and then there are changes along the length of the small intestine and along the length of the large intestine. So most of what we know there is from autopsy samples or from, uh, or, or from animal studies, but there's a lot of detail in there that I didn't get into today. So when you look at differences in people's microbiomes and they've got disease and you're moving back towards health, is there a limited set of recommendations? Like, does everything come down to, oh, just take uh, acidophilus? Uh, great question. Uh, very limited data. And um, just, just as in the same way there's been an increasing recognition that we can stratify people for drug responses, the same is almost certainly true for probiotic responses. Now, um, the, the, other, the other thing that it's important to remember is that probiotics are not blanket good, just in the same way that drugs are not blanket good, right? So a lot of the, a lot of the current state of the discourse is along the lines of, you know, I heard chemicals were good if you're feeling sick, and I felt sick, so I took a chemical, and now I feel better. You know, you'd have a lot of follow-up questions if someone told you that. You should have exactly the same follow-up questions if it's a live organism as if it's a small molecule. Uh, but, the, but that said, there are some very uh, nicely clinically validated probiotics for specific indications now, including IBD, uh, IBS, uh, post-antibiotic diarrhea, and so forth. And I think we'll see a lot more on the market soon. But a lot of that's happening in Europe and Japan, where the regulatory framework is a lot more favorable than in the US. Uh, like in the US, if you prove your probiotic works, it gets re-regulated from a supplement to a drug, and you have to do $2 billion in clinical trials before you can market it again. So it's kind of, it's kind of like uh, you can tell if a sports supplement doesn't work by the fact that it's legal. Uh, you know, if uh, probiotics that, that are demonstrated to work in clinical trials in the US are exceedingly rare for that reason. So... Um, uh, what was I? Oh, so so the the sampling so the sampling rate is a problem, right? Because mm -hmm. we saw that in Larry's talk, and you showed some of his data as well. That the week to week variation in microbial makeup in a fecal sample, and maybe even from point to point in the stool sample, which you know is much longer than the size of the microbe, um, indicates that there's huge variation in a given system. Yeah. And projects, you know, I've been following American Gut for a long time. I always sort of despaired with the idea of when do I send a sample in? Like, is this, is this going to be a good snapshot, a bad snapshot? Um, yeah. so, so are we waiting for something that you ingest that is a biomedical device that samples microbes, you know, over the course of a week and you take one of these sensors weekly or something? Like, what's the answer here? Uh, well, one, one um, so uh, variation within the stool, although there's been a lot of fuss made about it, we've done a fair number of tests and that's small compared to the variation between individuals. Uh, we recently got IRB approval to deposit some stool samples directly into a bucket of liquid nitrogen and we're going to, uh, you know, do 3D sectioning on it and um, do detailed metabolome and microbiome studies of that, uh, reconstruct the 3D image and that'll give very definitive answers to that question. But we already know that that variation is relatively small. Um, in terms of uh, variation within a subject, um, in general, variation day to day is much smaller than variation between different people. So um, you'll, you'll see studies of, of diet especially, where they'll present the data in a way that looks like there's a large change, but if you reprocess the data using um, a direct, uh, you know, directly answering the question, what does the variation with the dietary intervention look like compared to the variation between people, uh, unless it's a long-term intervention over months, what we've always seen in the short-term interventions is that people continue to resemble themselves, and uh, so that provides some hope. Um, in, terms, in terms of what we're doing, immediately uh, we're looking at more shelf-stable uh, ways, uh, way, ways of collecting and storing the samples. So the idea is that if you had something at home where you were just doing another sample every day and then periodically you could send them in, that would be really nice. We're also trying to figure out how to reduce the, reduce the price point, which would make it a lot more feasible for people just to do a lot of samples rather than waiting for the perfect, uh, for the perfect poop or whatever, which I think a lot of people are waiting for. And, and just really quickly, is, is the primary impact of the microbiome on human health, do you think it's really through the inflammatory cyto cytokine cascade pathway, or is there something else going on? Uh, we know for sure that that's happening, that they're signaling through the vagus nerve 
and uh, that there's a lot of metabolism that goes on in the gut that then acts systemically, including, uh, including modification of epigenetic markers. So for example, butyrates and HDAC inhibitor, and there's a number, a number of other microbial metabolites that uh, interact with host epigenetics. Um, I mean, in terms of sampling frequency, like I've been uh, looking at my own uh, microbiome every day for about the last eight years, I still don't pretend to understand it. Like, I think that's a lot of variation that it's going to take large cohorts sampled frequently to really track down. Um, but if you take an analogy from diet, right, we don't have to understand everything about, say, an orange, where if you run it through the mass spec, uh, you're going to see all these compounds where no one knows what they are and uh, no one's looked at them in detail. But the vitamin C in it's going to prevent you from getting scurvy. And, uh, you know, that's very well established. So I think it's going to be the same with the microbiome. We're not going to need full understanding in order to come up with useful interventions. Okay. I'm next. I think it was a great presentation. It was so much information. I think I had like five different questions and I'm just trying to remember what I wanted to ask. So you had uh, this experiment with a mouse where you transplant microbiome from one mouse to another and the mouse gets skinny. Mm -hmm. um, 15 years ago, I, I heard a, a keynote speaker from University of Washington and uh, she described an experiment like that, obi obi mouse and a skinny mouse, you transplant microbiome yeah, that, that would have been Ruth Lay from Washington University, who was a collaborator on the yeah. first iteration of this project that was published in PNAS in 2005. Yeah, but the mouse gets fat after a while. So the first microbiome, uh, change in microbiome helps, but then the mouse gets fat again. So it's it interplay between microbiome and, and uh, genome of an um, individual. So people who get fat because of antibiotics, they genome didn't change. So you think if you just go around every state where there is a lot of obesity and do transplant of the fecal transplants to everyone who is overweight, they can reverse back to whatever the genetic predisposition was before they got really fat? Yeah, so, so that's a really good question. And uh, we, so that is feasible in mice already. We don't know if it's feasible in humans yet. Uh, what, what, what you didn't hear her talk about 15 years ago, so since then, um, both in the OB-OB model and in the TLR5 model, where you have a genetic trigger that changes the community, and also in the diet-induced obesity paradigm, where you have a dietary trigger that induces obesity. In all those cases, you can take the fecal samples from the animal that you manipulated and then transfer them into germ-free mice that are otherwise unmanipulated, and you'll get the same weight gain. So uh, what, what's amazing about that is a lot of these triggers change the microbiome in a way that is then transmissible. And so, um, and so a lot of attention at the moment is focusing on how can you target the microbiome to revert it back to the state that you would have expected before whatever the intervention was. But the idea that you can have a genetic change uh, that causes a transmissible agent to arise, um, a very loose analogy is like prion diseases, right, where you, have, uh, where, where, you, where you have that kind of thing going on. The mechanism obviously is completely different, but the idea that you can have a genetic shift that then results in a transmissible phenotype Type has been established in a number of other cases. Thank you. I have one more question. And, and then you had um, this graph where uh, you show that the number of hours that a human sleeps mm -hmm. uh, affects the microbiome. I, I should clarify, we don't know causality for that. So it could be that your microbiome affects how many hours you sleep, or it could oh. be how many hours you sleep affect the yeah. microbiome. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if you controlled for stress, anxiety, and have you compared microbiome between people that are doing just fine on the four hours of sleep with no stress, anxiety, and being happy, and people who need 12 hours of sleep to be happy? A great question. We, we can't get that out of our citizen science data, but we have a sponsored project with the Office of Naval Research where we're following that up in detail at an experimental paradigm. Um, but you're asking exactly the right kinds of questions. One thing I should have pointed out is that none of the techniques to do this stuff existed five years ago. And most of the stuff that I'm showing you, the techniques have only existed for the last two or three. So the vast majority of questions you'd want to see answered haven't been answered yet. But uh, the great thing is that there's a lot to do out there. The tools are now available. And that's part of the reason why it's so exciting for people getting into the field at the moment, because of the, there's all these big questions like that that are very accessible and weren't accessible a few years ago, so no one's done them already. And uh, the outcomes are going to be really interesting. OK, uh, the last question. I'm not going to ask all the others that I also have. Uh, you also mentioned phage. Mm 
So you're sequencing microbiome. I look in at phage. There was a recent publication about uh, the differences in phage uh, species in people that have uh, some intestinal disorder versus people that are healthy. So yeah, again, that's a great question. There's less data on phage because when we do bacterial sequencing, we see only the bacteria. That's changing with a shift towards metagenomic sequencing where we pick up everything, including the phage. The main challenge is that the databases for annotating the phage sequences are very incomplete. So it has been difficult to understand uh, what's going on in the phage component of the genome. We know that there are a few cases that are really important. We know there are other cases where it is not important. So in mouse studies, uh, we can get those same phenotypic transplants by uh, isolating the bacteria, mixing them together, and transferring only the bacteria. So we know it's not phage. We know it's not small molecule metabolites. Uh, we know it's not cytokines. We know it's not all kinds of other things you transfer when you transfer the stool. But that's something that's going to need to be tracked down quantitatively and condition by condition. And that's one reason why if there's a negative uh, result that you get just by looking at the bacteria, that does not mean that you should not look at the phage or the fungi or other things that you miss when you do a bacterial-specific analysis. Thank you. Um, most of what I showed you here was bacterial, although not everything, like the HMP, we did shotgun metagenomic sequencing as well. Um, from the sort of epidemiology perspective, I remember hearing a very great talk about how uh, recent advent of very fast travel and cheaper travel has really affected the spread of pathogens. Mm -hmm. uh, have you sort of, uh, I'm sure you have, but what do you think about how that sort of recent mobil increase in mobility affects microbiome changes? Yeah, great question, no data. There's one study looking at the microbiome and jet lag from Aaron Segal and Aaron Adelinov at the Weissman Institute, where they basically show that the effects of jet lag on, uh, insulin, um, on insulin resistance are transmissible to mice by transmitting the human stool samples. But um, in terms of the spread of uh, beneficial microbes as well as harmful ones, there's been very little research on that, although it's a fascinating area to go after. Any other questions? I see one more. Uh, so uh, it seems you have uh, quite some success uh, in a lot of predictive power uh, using uh, genomic data to predict uh, IBS uh, and several other uh, health issues. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you see value in uh, increasing resolution of your data or incorporating, let's say, uh, modeling, like metabolic modeling uh, on reconstruction of the genomes to increase that predictive power? Yeah, absolutely. We are doing a lot on that right now with Carsten Zengler and Bernard Paulson, but uh, there's always room for additional approaches. Uh, um, Alhannon Borenstein has, has also done a lot on that recently and achieved some truly remarkable results. So uh, yeah, I think getting more out of the data and linking it more closely to metabolism is going to be really important going forward. That's great. That was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thanks again.